questions oral, oral questions. The Honourable Member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, we know that the Prime Minister and his Cabinet are going to approve the TMX pipeline project today. This is not a big surprise. However, what is very unclear is whether or not this pipeline will ever get built. So a very simple question for the Prime Minister. When will construction of the TMX pipeline commence in Burnaby this summer? Mr. Employment. We've been steadfast in our commitment to getting this right by following the Federal Court of Appeals guidance. Over the last number of months, the Minister of Natural Resources has met with communities from all four regions of the proposed project, and our Crown consultation teams have been on the ground engaging in meaningful two-way dialogue. Uh, we've committed to delivering this process in the right way for all Canadians, and we'll have more to say shortly. Honourable Member for Milton. So, no comfort there, Mr. Speaker. And quite frankly, this weekend, I spent my weekend in Milton talking to people on Main Street. I spent the last two days in Toronto talking to senior bankers and business people. And the one thing they all have in common, not a single one of them believes that this Prime Minister will get this pipeline built. And we won't believe it until we see shovels in the ground. So I'd ask again, what day will this pipeline commence construction in Burnaby, British Columbia. Honourable Minister of Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And look, for 10 years, the previous government cut corners with their blatant disregard for the courts, with no plans to protect the environment, coastal communities, and by failing to respect the rights of Indigenous communities. And in, all, in the process, all the Conservatives managed to do was divide Canadians. Mm -hmm. We will take no lessons from the Conservatives. We committed to getting this process right for all Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, you would think that a government who is seeking to be re-elected by the Canadian public would actually care about the fact that nobody believes they will build this pipeline. They can dredge up past stories of their own narratives, but the reality is they have to live with their actions now. Nobody believes they will build the pipeline, but here's the thing. They can tell us now exactly when they're going to commence construction. When will they commence construction in Burnaby this summer? The Honourable Minister of Employment. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the Conservatives continue to double down on their failed approach with their disregard for the courts, with no plan to protect the environment, no plan to protect the coastal communities, no respect for consult consultation with Indigenous communities. The only thing they ever achieved in their decade was to divide Canadians, and they even voted to defund the TMX reconsideration process. Mr. Speaker, we committed to getting this right. Abbotsford and others to wait until it's their turn to speak before doing so. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint-Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals talk about a lack of respect, but the Liberal leader is showing a lack of respect to Canadian energy and especially workers. We know that the Prime Minister lacks respect for people working on the pipelines. He wants to pipe oil to be eliminated and he wants prices to go up. That's a little liberal reality, Mr. Speaker. We know that in a few hours the government will be announcing uh, that uh, the pipeline project will go ahead. But when will the first shovel hit the ground? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's ironic that that government, that that uh, party would talk about through the legislation that we've we introduced to strengthen workers' rights in this country, to protect workers' rights, to create good jobs. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we've supported the creation of over a million jobs in this country since we were elected. Not standing up for workers, Mr. Speaker. This government will always stand up for workers, always stand up for jobs, and that's exactly what we're doing today. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. You just have to say something. Be patient. Four months and it will be done. <laughs> now, Mr. Speaker, as you know, the government hasn't done anything since it announced uh, Trans Mountain. A shovel hasn't been put in the ground. None of it's been built. Not even an inch. But they sent Canadians' money far, far away, thousands of kilometers away, to Houston. 
and they're going to be announcing that uh, the project will go ahead. When will the first shovel hit the ground? Minister of Employment. Once again, Mr. Speaker, they had a decade to, in fact, create things like pipelines and, in fact, were, did not result in any action. Why, Mr. Speaker? Because they blatantly disregarded the courts. They blatantly disregarded the rights of Canadians. They blatantly disregarded the rights of communities to have input, to have consultation on these projects that affect all of us. Mr. Speaker, we continue to support the process of consultation. The minister himself has held numerous consultations with Indigenous communities, with the coastal communities. We continue to listen and we'll have more to say shortly. Well, member for Burnaby South. The Prime Minister put for, puts forth a symbolic motion on the environment one day and a pipeline expansion the next. The pipeline will simply worsen the impact of climate change. This decision shows that the Liberals aren't taking the crisis seriously, nor are they respecting the rights of Indigenous peoples. What does the Prime Minister have to say to young people who want to defend the environment and who want sustainable jobs in the future? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I'm always happy to stand up and talk about how far hard we're working to protect the environment and to deal with climate change. Yesterday, we had a vote on a, a motion on the climate emergency. The Conservatives voted against it. The NDP voted in favour of it. But why aren't they in favour of the project that is supported by the NDP in BC? the LNG project that has created thousands of jobs that is also helping to grow the economy. The Honourable Member. Canadians are facing soaring temperature, forest fires, flooding. Canada should be a leader on climate innovation. Canada should be ending our subsidies to, forest, to fossil fuels. Instead, the Liberals are purchasing pipelines. They're continuing to uh, maintain Harper's, uh, Harper's targets, and they continue to subsidize fossil fuel sectors. We believe that there is a better way. The Liberals believe that there is better symbolism. When will the Prime Minister finally respect Indigenous communities, coastal communities, and defend our environment? Honourable Minister of Environment. Speaker, uh, we don't believe in symbolism. We believe in action. That's why. Order. I urge members to show other members the respect that they would like to be shown. Order. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Continuing on the theme of symbolism, this Prime Minister is great at a grand symbolic gesture, but always fails when it comes to helping people when it counts. Millions of Canadians don't have a place to live that's affordable, and they make difficult choices every day between buying their groceries or paying their rent. Now the PBO confirms what Canadians have learned, I've known all along, that instead of increasing the amount of funding for housing, this government has cut it yep. by one-fifth. Yes. When will the Prime Minister stop Jeez. making excuses and actually build our plan builds half a million new affordable homes for Canadians. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Speaker, our government proudly introduced Canada's first ever national housing strategy because we recognize that every Canadian deserves a safe, affordable place to call home. The new report on housing from the Parliamentary Budget Officer highlights that without the national housing strategy, housing investments in this country would have been cut by more than 75 percent over this next decade. Mr. Speaker, we are maintaining the momentum and the growth to ensure that Canadians have the housing that they need, deserve, and can afford. The Honourable Member. Cutting funding to housing. Yeah. Don't make up stuff. Les rapports to DPB. The reports by the PBO are clear. Burnaby South to direct his comments to the chair. Now remember for Burnaby South. 
The reports by the PBO are clear and confirm what we've been saying for months. The Liberals aren't producing the results for housing the people need. The Prime Minister is very good with symbolic gestures, but he's not there for people when it counts. Canada is facing a housing crisis affecting all regions of the country. When will the Liberals get serious and help people to obtain the affordable housing that they need? Now, the Minister of Public Safety. Your thanks to our unprecedented investments in housing since taking office in 2015, we have helped more than a million Canadians find a place to call home, and the national housing strategy ensures that we'll continue to be a full and active partner in Canada's housing sector for the decade to come. Right. Mr. Speaker, I've had the honour in my own constituency to hope to to dig the, the, the help to dig the foundations and to open the new buildings that new citizens in my riding are able to enjoy. Order. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthur Basca. Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Budget Officer was clear last week. The Liberal government's carbon tax will take even more money out of Canadians' pockets. What the Prime Minister doesn't want to say is that in addition to being twice as high as announced, they'll be increasing it. They'll be ra raising the price of fuel by 22 cents a litre. So my question for the Prime Minister is simple. Why will he again increase the price of fuel by 23 cents a litre? This will have an impact on all kinds of uh, consumer products. If the Honourable uh, Member from the West Minister Burnaby and the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Social Development wish to have a conversation, they might want to do that outside. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Monsieur President. Mr. Speaker, as the opposition knows, we established a price on pollution because it can't be free. Polluting can, cannot be free. We owe it to our children and our families. 80% of families will have more money in their pockets. I'm not sure if the members opposite saw last week that what the Pope said. He said we need a price on pollution. Why do we need a price on pollution? Because it works. Honorable Deputy. The Honourable Member of Richmond, Arthabasca. The Liberals' record is disastrous when it comes to the environment and their past four years, the way they've managed to Canadians' finances so irresponsibly. Four years of deficit as well. Who's going to pick up the tab? Our children and grandchildren and Canadian workers who are working hard to earn money. And what does the Liberal Party and their leader want to do? Increase taxes on Canadians. Why is this government, why is the Prime Minister so bent on raising the price of fuel by 23 cents a litre? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. I'm happy with our what we're doing as a government. We've created a million jobs uh, with Canadians. We have lifted 800,000 people out of poverty. We've reduced taxes for small and medium-sized businesses. And what else are we doing? We're dealing with climate change. Yesterday, I was ashamed because the Conservative Party said there was no climate emergency, that we don't need to reach our Paris targets. We do, don't need to work on these issues. This is what we're going to be leaving our children and our grandchildren. We are facing a climate emergency. Two years ago, almost to the day, this finance minister unleashed an attack on small businesses. He tried to raise taxes on, the, on their investment up to 73 percent and double the tax on parents selling their businesses to their children. He backed down partially and temporarily after a massive uprising. Two questions. Will he admit that this attack on small business was wrong? And two, will he promise never to try it again? Honourable Minister of Finance. Speaker, we know that results count. 
We're in a position where our economy is doing better than anyone expected this stage. We have the lowest rate of unemployment we've seen in 40 years. We have the highest rate of working age population at work than we've ever seen in the history of this country. One of the big reasons for that is because small and medium-sized businesses are doing well. We lowered their tax rates. They are now experiencing the lowest tax rates among G7 countries. We've continued to support business in this country, and what they've done, they've created jobs so Canadians are working. It's good news all around. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, we just saw it right there, and small businesses across the land will notice. This minister had an opportunity to rule out bringing back his original tax increases that he proposed in the summer of 2017, and he refused to rule it out. We know it's coming after the election. Just like the carbon tax. We found out from the parliamentary budget officer it'll raise gas prices 23 cents a litre. Why doesn't the government honestly admit that now before the election? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we did take on the additional $150 billion of debt left us by the previous Conservative government. What we did was we decided that with that, that we would actually focus on the middle class because we knew that they would be the engine of growth for our country. So we focused on them. We increased the amount of money going to people that are struggling to get by. And lo and behold, our economy rebounded. Lo and behold, lowest unemployment rate in 40 years. Now it's good news, but we're going to keep on working for the middle class. We're going to keep making sure that businesses are successful. Our approach is working. Honourable Member for Carleton. Listen, I've just given two opportunities to this minister to admit that his original attack on small business people in the summer of 2017 was wrong and that he would never try it again. We know he's running out of other people's money, and he'll be looking for more of it if he's re-elected. But now we found, find out that he's open to reintroducing his 73% tax on small business investment. And he's open to doubling the tax on families selling from parent to child. Why doesn't he just admit that's exactly what he will do if re-elected? Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we know that confidence among small and medium-sized businesses, confidence among large businesses is critically important. That's why we never resort to scare tactics like those. What we do is we focus on how we can actually make a difference. And the good news is the things we've done have actually made a difference. The fact that Canadians have more money in their pockets means they're putting it back into the economy, means they're actually buying goods from small and medium-sized businesses. And the good news is, it's working. Canadians are doing well, and we're going to keep on it. Order. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Scare tactics. This is a finance, oh, this is a Prime Minister who said our small businesses are nothing more than tax cheats. This is a finance minister who tried to impose a 73% tax on small business investment. This is a government that attempted to double the tax on parents selling their businesses to children. So they'd have a tax advantage in selling it to foreign multinationals. Scare tactics. This government scared the hell out of small business right across this country. And they could put some of those fears to rest if they would admit now they would promise now they will never do it again. Honourable Minister of Finance. Order. Mr. Speaker, it is very important that we listen to people in the business community to figure out what we should do to make sure our economy keeps doing well. What they've told us, first and foremost, is that skills matter. So what did we do? We ensured that people could have access to university by lowering the cost of university for low- and middle-income Canadians. We put in place an approach to ensure that people can get the training they need over the long term. They also told us that taxes mattered, so we lowered the taxes on small and medium-sized businesses. What we know, Mr. Speaker, is that our approach is working. We're going to continue to focus on what really matters to business to keep our economy. The Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, we already know that saying one thing and doing the opposite is the Liberal Party's trademark. But stating that we're facing a climate emergency and the next day authorizing a pipeline expansion 
on a pipeline that will represent the same amount as pollution as uh, three million cars isn't just hypocrisy, it's taking people for fools. How does the government dare claim to call itself ecological when it's betraying future generations with these false environmental policies? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, we're working very hard to, to deal with climate change. We put a price on pollution across the country. We are eliminating carbon and we are focusing on transition. We are focusing on clean energy for jobs across the country. We're investing as well in public transit, in infrastructure, green infrastructure. I could say, give many more examples, but I'm very disappointed as are Canadians in the Conservative Party. They can't to join forces with Canadians and w everyone else in this house to say that we're facing a climate emergency. To Westminster Burnaby. Canadians are disappointed in them because with this irresponsible rubber stamp, Liberals are trashing the Paris Agreement forever and vandalizing our coastal environment and marine life. Climate leaders don't try to ram through raw bitumen pipelines and they don't run roughshod over Indigenous rights. Just one spill will wipe out thousands of jobs in the fisheries and tourism for a generation. Liberals are throwing away $17 billion from taxpayers to threaten jobs, the environment in BC. Why didn't they say no to oil lobbyists? Why didn't they say yes to future generations? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, Canadians elected our government on a plan to grow the economy and protect the environment. That's exactly what we're delivering. We've invested over $1.5 billion in the Oceans Protection Plan. Yep. We have a national climate plan with over 50 measures, investing over $50 billion in the green economy. Right. We're also putting in place a process to make sure research projects move forward in the right way. If we're up to the NDP, there will be no new investments in any new None. natural resource sector. Right. Just look at the LNG Canada. We're not sure where they stand. Mr. Speaker, we are focused on getting the energy sector uh, in moving forward the Honourable Member for Shikutumi de Fior. Mr. Speaker, Bill C-69 will hinder the development of natural resources across the country. Even Quebec is opposed to it. As it was said, it perpetuates the duplication of environmental procedures and broadens the federal government's influence. Bill C-69 will block the export of electricity which is an essential opportunity for Quebec's, opportunity, uh, Qu Quebec's economy. Why block Quebec's economic development? No, no, no. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, when we were elected, we said we would put in place a, a better uh, assessment processes for large projects because it was a mess under the Conservatives' plan, Stephen Harper's government. They didn't listen to Indigenous peoples. They didn't want to protect the environment. They didn't listen to people who were facing problems with the projects. That's not how projects move forth. We need to listen. For Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, nine provinces are opposed to the Prime Minister's attack on resource development in Canada. These Liberals stifle debate and ram through bills that block oil exports and kill energy projects. 21 industry leaders announced that this is the end of future growth and those investors have abandoned this important sector. When will this Prime Minister finally admit that no more pipelines and oil export ban bills are part of his plan to phase out Canada's energy sector. Okay. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, Canadians expect a transparent assessment of major projects that they can trust, and businesses need assessments to be done in a timely and efficient way. The Harper Conservatives gutted this process. They made Canadians lose trust and hurt our economy and energy sector at the same time. Our better rules will ensure resource development is done in the way that protects the environment, grows our economy, properly consults Indigenous peoples, and creates good middle-class jobs. That's what Canadians expect, and that's what we'll continue to deliver. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister 
dismissed six premier's calls for changes to Bill C-69 yeah. as partisan, but he also rejected requests from the liberal premiers of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador for offshore oil and gas. These liberals already killed over $100 billion in major projects, and the Bank of Canada predicts no new energy investment after 2019. The liberal shipping ban, Bill C-48, blocks the West Coast. Their poison pill in C-86 allows the same thing on every other coast, and C-69 will harm the whole country. Will the Liberals kill these anti-energy bills before it's too late? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, Stephen Harper's field system of gutted, he gutted environmental assessments. He rammed through a new process without any consultation through an omnibus budget bill. Where did that get us? That got us more polarization. That got us fights across the country. And what did it not get us? Good projects were not to go ahead in a timely way. We built better rules that will ensure that we listen to Indigenous peoples, that we protect the environment, that we listen to concerns of Canadians, and yes, ensures that good projects get built in a timely way because we have $500 billion of economic opportunity. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. But businesses, municipalities, and Indigenous communities say the Liberals' yeah. anti-pipeline, anti-rail, anti-hydro, anti-business, Bill C-69 will, will hurt all of Canada. The Canadian manufacturers and exporters say it will make it, quote, in some cases, impossible for nationally significant resource development. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce says, quote, the impacts will be severe across Canada. Nine provinces and all territories want major changes to Bill C-69. Quebec calls it, quote, a veto over economic development. So will the Liberals stop Bill C-69? Honourable Parliament, the Secretary, the Minister of Natural Resources. Speaker, we are, better, we are putting in place better rules to protect the environment, respect Indigenous rights, attract investment, and create good middle-class jobs. Hundreds of major resource projects worth over $500 billion in investments are planned across Canada over the next 10 years. A robust project list will ensure good projects can move forward in a timely, transparent way that protects the environment, rebuilds public trust, and strengthens our economy. Mr. President. Excellent. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon West. Mr. Speaker, we have a housing crisis in Canada, and the Liberals are failing to address it. The PBO report shows that the Liberals are inflating their own figures, while families in our communities are facing constant stress to find a place to call home. The report says the Liberals are doing even less to help people with immediate housing needs than the Harper government. Mr. Speaker, I find this shameful. Enough with the empty promises. Will this government act now to end homelessness and ensure families in Canada have a place, have a place to call home? Thank you. The Honourable Parliament, the Secretary to the Ministry of Social Development. Mr. Speaker, very proud of the National Housing Strategy, and as the public, uh, the PBO correctly identifies, a 62% increase in frontline services to fight homelessness will help us reduce chronic homelessness by 50%. As well, we are targeted on lifting 500,000 Canadians out of core housing need. What the PBO doesn't count is the Canada Housing benefit, an $8.4 billion program. It doesn't also take into account the federal provincial territorial agreements which we've locked in, which guarantee a 15% increase in housing supply. And it also doesn't properly qualify the loans and financing which are building thousands of housing units across the country. The NHA, the National Housing Strategy is working, building real housing for real people. The Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, a Powell River judge sentenced a crab poacher recently, and in her decision, she noted that Fisheries and Oceans Canada is woefully understaffed. Law-abiding fishers struggle to make ends meet because of climate change, habitat destruction, and tighter restrictions, while they have no choice but to watch as poachers and over-harvesting destroy local ecosystems. Will the minister listen to this judge and to my constituents and get more DFO staff on the water doing the work they need to do? Well, Mr. Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. This government has done an enormous amount of work to restore the capacity of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans after it was gutted by the previous Harper government. A hundred million dollars in operating cost reductions, gutting of the Fisheries Act in 2012. We've just restored the protections from the, in the Fisheries Act. We've made significant investments in science. We've made significant investments in enforcement and protection. And we will continue to do so so that the fisheries are managed in a sustainable way going forward. Here, here. Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. 
I wear this beaded jacket, which has the image of Indigenous women, so I, we, may never forget that we all have a role in the giving of voice to those who have been ignored for far too long. In 2017, S3 was finally passed with a delay concerning the 1951 cutoff criteria. The government said it needed time to consult on an implementation plan. The Minister's Special Representative has completed her consultations and report, which was just tabled in Parliament. Indigenous women and their descendants want to know when will they finally have their human rights restored. The Honourable Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. From Winnipeg Centre and thank him for his ongoing advocacy on this. Gender equality is a fundamental human right and Bill S3 does eliminate the sex-based discrimination from the Indian Act. With the Ministerial Special Representative's consultations concluded and her report tabled, we now know what our partners need in a successful implementation plan. Work on that implementation plan is well underway and I can confirm that we will be bringing these provisions into force within the current mandate. Date. We're committed to working with our partners to remedy all remaining registration issues, but also to accelerate the progress to self-determination by which nations... The Honourable Member for Pont neuf jacques cartier Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government has no credibility when it comes to the environment. It says that its plan will help Canada meet its Paris targets. But all the experts, scientists, environmental organizations, and government organizations have confirmed that Canada will not succeed in meeting those targets. The Liberals think that they alone are all-knowing. And hypocritically, they don't tell Canadians the truth. The Liberals need to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Why won't this Liberal government tell the truth, Mr. Speaker? Honorable Minister of the Environment. Why did the Conservative Party vote against our motion on the urgency of climate change? Do they not understand the science of climate change? Do they not recognize that we are paying the costs of an action now? Do they not recognize that in Quebec, where the member is from, that there is a plan to deal with carbon and that that plan is reducing greenhouse gas emissions? They have a clean tech sector. And so perhaps the member should speak to Quebecers. Order. <clears throat> I've heard the member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies many times today. And normally I enjoy that, but he hasn't had the floor. So I'd ask him to wait until he has the floor before interjecting. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, the Liberals have fallen far short of their Paris targets. And that should come as no surprise, Mr. Speaker. They don't have a pl climate plan. They have a tax plan. Whether pretending that they won't raise the carbon tax past $50 per tonne, or trotting out ministers to criticize a climate plan they haven't even seen yet, these Liberals are increasingly desperate to distract from their own climate failures. Yeah. When will the minister finally admit, when will she tell the truth and admit that they will not meet their Paris targets? Wow. Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, I want to go back to 2015. A member opposite came to Paris. He came when we negotiated the Paris Agreement. He came when Canada said, we are back, we are serious, we're taking climate action. We negotiated for one year a climate plan with over 50 measures. But yesterday we saw, we saw the hypocrisy of the Conservative Party. It voted against climate emergency motion. It voted against taking action to meet our Paris Agreement target. It voted against a safe and cleaner future for our kids. It voted against a $26 trillion opportunity of clean. You could always have a shorter question period if numbers want that. If they can't hear the questions and the answers, they might have to. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lérable. Mr. Speaker, the diplomatic crisis with China is getting worse and worse. Canada's reputation abroad is in ruins because of this Prime Minister, and China is even refu refusing to return his calls. The Liberal leader needs to stop making excuses. After canola and soy, China is now targeting pork, and yet China needs Canadian pork more than ever. Standing up doesn't just mean posing for photo ops, Mr. Speaker. It means defending our farmers. Why won't the Prime Minister stand up to China? Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, 
Quite to the contrary, we are standing up and we've been doing so from the very beginning. We do it every day. Our pork farmers provide very high quality products. It's true that China informed us that they had suspended a pork uh, producer after having identified the presence of uh, an additive, which was uh, authorized under international rules, but was banned in China. I can ensure you that the CFIA is following this uh, closely, and we take this very seriously. Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, for months the government has defended its lack of progress with China by claiming that they have built a coalition of countries who support freeing two Canadians from a Chinese okay. prison. While a consensus among friends is helpful, this Prime Minister has yet to translate this global support into action. It rests with this Prime Minister to step up himself and demonstrate we are serious when dealing with China. When will this Prime Minister act to break this deadlock with China and free our wrongfully imprisoned Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. You, uh, Mr. Speaker, as with every issue, our priority is the best interests of Canada and Canadians. We've ensured that China is well aware of every one of our positions. We have indeed rallied an unprecedented number of countries who are speaking out in support of Canadians. This should not be about grandstanding. It should not be about scoring political points. This is about working persistently, carefully, and resolutely to get brave Canadian homes and to ensure that our farmers have access to markets. Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, Canadians depend on services like health care, education, and supports with children with autism. But instead of properly funding them, Liberal and Conservative governments across this country keep telling Canadians to expect less and slash services. Meanwhile, rich corporations have avoided paying $26 billion in taxes. Why are they getting away with it? Imagine the services Canadians could receive with that money. Will Liberals ever have the courage to stand up to rich corporations? Or will they continue to watch and do nothing as Canadians struggle? Honourable yeah. Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the unique challenges face, uh, that Canadians face uh, when they're dealing with autism, and that's why that we're taking action to support them through community-based projects, a national research and exchange, exchange network program to help them find work and groundbreaking new research. We will continue to work with community groups, caregivers, and others to ensure that all Canadians with autism get the support and the help that they need. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Uh, Honourable Member for Sherbrooke. Mr. Speaker, due to the inaction of successive liberal and conservative, conservative governments, we lose $26 billion in taxes every year, and the minister is refusing to get it back. To give you an idea of how much money this is, it's equivalent to eight super host hospitals, six Champlain bridges, or 650,000 affordable housing units. So, Mr. S and Mr. Speaker, when will this government find a bit of courage and finally reform our outdated tax laws that benefit the wealthiest? The Honourable Minister of National Revenue. The five reports from the CRA uh, refer to stats from 2014, so actually before our government started tackling this problem and after 10 years of inaction under the, the, gov the Conservatives. In fact, the report confirms that we are on the right track with historic investments of over a billion dollars. And contrary to what the NDP and Conservatives uh, believe, we believe that we should make decisions based on facts. The Honourable Member for Belchest is at Chemin Lévis. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Summer Jobs Program is supposed to make people, young people, uh, work in the summer, but the Liberals are using it to fund organizations that, are, that have ties to terrorism. Uh, the Islamic Society of North America in Mississauga Lakeshore is banned by the CRA because of its ties to terrorist organizations. And the Liberals are giving them money. Do they take terrorism seriously? And if so, what is the minister waiting for to revoke this funding? Mr. Lampois. Honorable Minister of Labor. This government stands against terrorism. I understand the members' concerns. My officials are looking into this, as I said. We expect all organizations that receive funding for of the program. I've asked the department to examine this organization in question, and if, in fact, the organization is using the money in a way that violates anybody's charter rights or places that student in, in an unsafe position, then they won't be eligible for reimbursement for that position. Thank 
question, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. The problem is charter rights are granted to those who call Canada home. What we're talking about is terrorist activities that are taking place in Pakistan. Mr. Speaker, the question is simple. The responsibility of any government, their number one responsibility is to uphold the rule of law. It's particularly problematic then that the money in this case went to where it did. And so here's the thing, is that to receive the Canada Jobs funding, organizations have to pass the Liberals' autocratic values test. The question is this then, did this organization in fact pass the Liberals' test on this? Honourable Minister of Employment. Uh, listen, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite should put the whistle down. It's disappointing, but not surprising, that the member would spread such dishonest rhetoric. What can we expect from the party who reads the words of an Islamic My members don't think it's important to listen, whether they agree or not. Now, I also mem I urge members to be judicious in their comments, and also I ask the member for Wellington Halton Hills not to be yelling when someone else has the floor. The Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Well, Mr. Speaker, clearly the Minister is scared to answer the actual question. The Liberals have given $26,000 in Canada summer jobs funding to a group linked to terrorism. The activities of that group, the Islamic Society of North America Canada, are known to this government because the Canada Revenue Agency already suspended their charitable right. status because of their connection to militant extremists. That didn't stop the Liberal MP from Mississauga Lakeshore from signing off on the funding. The Minister's had this file on her desk for a week. It should have taken her five minutes. Why does she cancel the funding today? for kids. In fact, if they were so concerned about jobs for Canadian youth, why did they oppose critical funding for things like the Youth Employment and Skills Strategy, the Student Work Integrated Learning Program, Apprenticeship Grants? Why did they let youth unemployment rates reach its highest rate since the 90s under their watch? Our government has doubled this program, Mr. Speaker. In fact, over 70,000 students each summer since we've been elected have received quality student jobs, which has led to the lowest No need for this constant hot cacophony when others are speaking. The Honourable Member for Charleswood, St. James, and Cinnaboya heading the order. Mr. Speaker, both as a Member of Parliament and a physician, I've heard from constituents, patients, and many others about the high cost of prescription drugs. Canadians are proud of their universal public health care system, but we know that nearly one million Canadians have to give up essentials like food to pay for their medication. That's why I'm heartened to see our government taking action on this critical issue. Can the Minister of Health update the House on our work to make prescription drugs affordable for more Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my colleague from Manitoba for his question, his important work on the Health Committee, and also his advocacy for Pharmacare. Mr. Speaker, no Canadian should have to choose between putting food on their table and pay for prescription medication. And that's why that our, gov our government is committed to making sure that all Canadians have access to a yes. national pharmacy care yes. program and the work is underway in budget 2019 we received 35 million dollars to create the canadian drug agency and also a billion dollars to address the high cost of rare diseases mr speaker we will not rest until every canadian has access to a national pharmacare program thank yes. you well, member for thornhill 
Last week, the PM claimed the Liberal MP for Steveston, Richmond East, had addressed allegations of his law firm's handling of a Chinese drug boss's real estate deal. This week, faced by details of another suspicious deal revealed by BC's money laundering inquiry, the Minister for Organized Crime wouldn't address unproven allegations. Now, the PM attacks small business owners as tax cheats without evidence. But in this latest emerging Liberal scandal, no action. Why is there one set of rules for Liberals, another for everyone else? Why? As our Minister of Border Security. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the member from Thornhill may wish to test the veracity of his, his uh, speculations outside of the protection of this House. But, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about money laundering. Our government has, has demonstrated that we will take all measures available to us to stop organized crime. And that includes an investment of $172 million for the RCMP, for FinTrack and, C and CRA, to establish an enforcement team, as well as making criminal code amendments. Mr. Speaker, this is the same government in the last four years of the Harper government that cut $500 million from the RCMP mm -hmm. and closed all 12 of the indicators. Order. 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 The Honourable Member for Belay Chambly. Mr. Speaker, residents of my riding are in Ottawa protesting the construction of the TELUS Tower in Otterburn Park. Students from Notre Dame School, Romain, Laurence, and Emma Rose, started a petition which has now been signed by over 100 students to protect what they call our magnificent forest. If the minister won't listen to the municipality, will he at least listen to the young people who are defending our environment against the TELUS Tower? Will he cancel? the construction uh, of the uh, tower in Otterburn Park. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as I've said several times, the government believes that communities should have their voice uh, heard when it comes to the construction of cell towers uh, on their land. We will be openly and transparently consulting communities. Uh, however, this is before the courts, and I don't think it would be uh, advisable for me to comment further. For Cumberland Colchester. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A 2004 RCMP report concluded that the RCMP 911 call center should be, and I quote, outside of HRM due to the risks of placing the two, police, two largest police communication centers in close proximity to each other. The risk given were risks of environmental disasters and threats to our communication systems. Strangely, a new RCMP report says, and I quote, the 2004 concerns were reassessed and they no longer are a risk. Would the minister ask the RCMP to make available the study that explains why environmental disasters and communications risks were a risk in 2004? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Speaker, the Honourable Member has been in touch with me many times about this matter. The safety of Nova Scotians is the top priority for the RCMP's H Division, which functions as Nova Scotia's provincial police force. In that capacity, they make the necessary decisions about the most effective deployment of provincial assets and facilities, including the Provincial Operations and Communications Centre. They are obtaining the counsel of an independent assessor to ensure that their provincial response Responsibilities are safely and properly discharged in the best interests of Nova Scotians. Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Mr. Speaker, in March 2016, the Prime Minister promised to resolve the softwood lumber dispute. He said, quote, I'm confident that we are on track to resolving this irritant in the coming weeks and months. That was three years ago. Yesterday, the third mill in my riding in two weeks closed its door. They have lots of time for their millionaire friends, but when it comes to the BC job workers, they can't lift a finger. Will the Prime Minister finally make good on his promise to resolve the softwood with lumber dispute and save jobs. Yeah. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, the Conservatives simply don't know what they're talking about on this issue. Our government saw the consequences of the wretched quota deal the Conservatives accepted on softwood lumber, which is why we refuse to accept tariffs for quotas on steel and aluminum. We're continuing our legal challenges against the U.S. softwood duties through NAFTA, through the WTO, where Canadian softwood has always won in the past. Our government will always defend Canadian workers and Canadian industry. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. 
Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Justice said that Law 21 infringed on people's fundamental rights and freedoms and that he would always defend the Charter. In other words, he intends to challenge Quebec's secularism law. My question is simple. Is the minister waiting until after the election to challenge Bill 21 because he's afraid of how Quebecers will react? Honorable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, our position has always been clear. It's not up to the state to, or, or politicians to tell people what they should or should not wear. Canada is already a secular state, and that is reflected in our institutions. We believe that this new law does infringe on people's fundamental rights and freedoms, and we will always defend the Charter. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, there's nothing new about the state telling people what they can or can't wear. Soldiers wear a uniform. So do police officers, uh, RCMP officers, and prison guards. Men right here in this House of Commons have to wear a tie in order to be recognized. And I haven't heard the Minister of Justice complain about that. So what is the real reason the Minister of Justice wants to challenge this secularism bill, which has the support of Quebecers? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, we are the party of the Charter. We have always defended uh, people's rights and freedoms that are in the Charter, as well as other fundamental rights. Mr. Speaker, it is not up to the government or any political party to tell people what they should wear or what they shouldn't wear. Fasten. That's easy. Deputy <laughs> DeBose. Honorable Member for Bose. Free speech is the foundation of a free society. And yet, after erasing the statement of the member for St. Albert and Mountain from the record, the Justice Committee proposed several measures to censure free speech on Internet. Does this government understand that the novel 1984 was meant to be a warning against the dangers of a totalitarian society and not an instruction manual? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, as, as the Honourable Member full well knows, uh, free speech is something, expre free expression is something that we value in this country. Uh, he should also know, Mr. Speaker, that uh, in the current context uh, with, with online platforms, that the, the limits of free speech, uh, justifiable limits of free speech, is something that any government uh, should be looking into, as the Prime Minister uh, did when he was in Paris and looked at the, the uh, Christchurch Declaration.